But the main thing this evening um, is is it something about on the buses. And I had a, I had a, a bit of a laugh with Andy about this because I can remember the TV show. Um, I think it was 1969 or there about uh, Reg Varney starring in on the buses. Um, Blakey was the was the um, the inspector or something. You know, it, it, it was very well talked about. They had they actually had three films, but this is nothing to do with Reg Varney, and I don't think Andy would be mentioning anything about that because this is all to do with the campaign for better bu buses. And it's a campaign which Andy and Maria are very much involved in. Um, and I was approached um, five or six weeks ago and asked if they could actually do a presentation to let us all know uh, about the campaign for better buses uh, within um, CWAC. So I don't know who's going to speak first, whether it's going to be you, Andy, or whether it's going to be Maria, um, but I will leave it to you now because I'm going to mute myself and say, Welcome. Okay, cheers, uh, David. Um, I need to share screen. Um, can I do that, or do you need to make me a? I really can't do things like that. Um, <laughs> Just make me. You should have told me before, and then I would have made Anne the the host because she can actually do it, can't you, Anne? <laughs> so how how do I how do I get Anne to be? Go to, go to participants. Go to participants, yes, love. It should be if you click on my name, if it, yeah. something like more yeah. will come up. Yeah, make, make host. You are, now, you are now host. Wow. Um, okay. I can, I can close you. the meeting by mistake again. <laughs> can, can you do it, Anne? Hold on, hold on. You should have told me at the beginning. I tried to, you were talking. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Right, Andy, have a go. Okay, let's have a look. Let's see if I can do it. Can people see that? Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. From the beginning. There we go. So uh, uh, Maria's going to kick off. It's a bit of a double act. Um, so I hope you in enjoy the presentation. And Maria, when you're ready. Are you there, Maria? Once she's get herself sorted, this is our logo. Maria is going Thank to have to unmute you. herself. <laughs> so thanks for joining us tonight. We're Better Bus Coalition West Cheshire. We're a small group. It's not just me and Andy. There is a small group of us. We're all quack residents who are campaigning to bring public transport back into public ownership and to be free at the point of use. We hope to show you that a free bus could help reduce carbon emissions in the area, improve people's well-being and add value to the local economy. So if you go on to the next slide, Andy. So we start off with a bit of a nostalgia, a local retro bus. So this takes us back to how the buses used to be when they were regulated and publicly owned. The reason we set up the campaign is because we feel the bus system is broken and needs a radical overhaul. Transport touches everyone's life, whether it's getting to work, shopping and meeting friends, it connects people. A free bus system would be accessible to all within the local area. So this is how the presentation is gonna be structured. We're gonna look at the government's national bus strategy, then why we need a bus free bus campaign, what the barriers are and how we plan to succeed. Right. So in March this year, the government unveiled the National Bus Strategy. Its main aim is to get bus usage firstly back to its pre-COVID levels and then to increase further. So they say that the bus is also key to two of their wider priorities of net zero and levelling up. Next slide, please. So the government fully acknowledged that the current regulated, deregulated bus system is broken and much needs to be done to repair it. They've come up with this list of improvements that need to happen in order to achieve increased patronage, net zero and levelling up. So 
if we relate this to the local area between 2015 and 2019, 27 routes were discontinued in the Quack area, but only three introduced in that same period. Passenger numbers reduced by 12% from 10.5 million in 2015 to 16 to 9.3 million in 2018 to 19. So the link between accessibility and passenger numbers is clear and passenger numbers have been heading in the wrong direction even before COVID. But also in terms of accessibility, improvements need to be made for disability access. And as Cheshire West has a large rural setting with transport deserts, an overhaul is needed in these areas too. Next slide, please. So how are the government going to overhaul the bus system? by a combination of regulation and financial support. So firstly, financially, they will provide funding for 4,000 new zero emission buses and a long-term transformational fund of 3 billion, which is in addition to the 1 billion provided during the, the pandemic. Secondly, the buses will be regulated through either franchising or enhanced partnerships. All local authorities, sorry, can we have the next slide, please? Yep. All local authorities not applying for franchising must commit to establishing enhanced partnerships with the bus operators by June 21. And this agreement must be in place by April 22 in order for the funding to be received. Only when the commitments are made between the operator and the local transport authority will grants be available. Formulating an enhanced partnership or franchise takes a lot of time. The government has given councils an almost impossible timescale to achieve this, which has resulted in councils, including Quack, as far as I'm aware, having to opt for the less arduous route of enhanced partnership. We don't feel there is enough time to consult properly and negotiate with the bus companies and therefore the resulting agreements will be lacking. So if councils don't complete the agreements within with the operators by the deadline, this could affect grants that they receive and in turn affect the provision of bus services. Next slide. So what's the difference between a franchise and an enhanced partnership? With a franchise, the local transport authority would decide on the routes, the frequency, the ticket prices, etc. It would have full control and the operator would need to comply. With an enhanced partnership, the operator works with the local transport authority to develop and deliver improvements for passengers and they have more of a say on how the buses should be improved. We feel the franchise route is the better option for the Quack area long term, but the government are making it hugely difficult to obtain franchise status. Next slide, please. Okay. It's all to you. So why do we need a free bus campaign? Well, there's lots of reasons. For us, the main ones are climate change, green jobs, and improving the connectability within the TWAC area. So what's been said locally about um, the climate in, uh, in, in the CWAC area? Well, the council brilliantly announced a climate emergency, which is great. And for me, they use the correct terminology. They use the word, we're in an existential crisis. And I want you to think about the word existential and what that means to you. What is existential? I've got an idea what it is. I'm wondering whether anyone else thinks the, the same, but we're in one. Um, so what CWAC did is they commissioned a report from um, Anthesis to have a look at how they could reduce CO2 levels to meet uh, zero carbon emissions by 2050. So what did that report say? Well, just want you to, it's a bit of a busy slide, but I just want you to focus on the first pie chart and the third pie chart and look at the blue bits. On the left hand side, the first pie chart, I'm going to read 
to, uh, to say what that is. It's, it's data that Anthesis have uh, picked up and they've modified it uh, so that it's national data and they've modified it to fit into a local kind of um, scenario. And they've also pushed some further ambition with that uh, data. And they get a 19% CO2 emissions by transport. If you look at the third pie chart, that's been done from local authority emissions data and they get 23%. So it doesn't really matter how you kind of get the data. The point is that transport is a huge issue. It's a big issue and it's an issue that the council can have an input on. But how are they going to do it? And when are they going to do it? Well, to understand the when, we need to look at the UN GAP report. Now, the UN produce a uh, emissions gap report every year. And what this report is about, it's measuring where we are now and where we need to be by 2050. And they've put in a pivotal point in that of 2030. So what they're saying is that by 2030, we must have reduction in CO2 levels at a certain point to be able to achieve them by 2050 without more radical change to do that. Um, and all that is, all those targets are based on keeping the rise in temperature to 1.5 degrees or less. So how does that kind of translate into local terms? Another little busy slide, but I just want you to focus on the three lines. Uh, going up the um, axis, uh, going vertical, is CO2 emissions. And along the horizontal is time. Now, I mentioned the 2030 as a pivotal point, and you'll see three little dots there. Now, this is from the Anthesis report, and I'll read out what the three mean. If you have a look at the blue line, this assumes that the council doesn't take much action beyond the current national policy and the national-led decarbonisation of the electricity grid. And you can see it's woefully inadequate. We're not going to get anywhere near zero zero carbon by 2050. The green line, that's scatter level four, and, and that's the most ambitious targets set by Anthesis for the council to follow. And that assumes that they will do a lot more and significantly a lot more than the national policy and the national grid assumptions. And you can see that that green line does actually meet zero by 2050. The dotted red line, that's the Paris Agreement. And that's kind of scientifically um, worked out uh, of what we need. And you can see that that also gets us to zero by 2050. But I think what we've got to remember when we look at this report and the options it's given the council from it is that the Paris Agreement, although science-based, it's politically agreed. And what that means is that all the countries that signed up to it, they all, could, they all argued and got down to the lowest common denominator they could get to, which is that red dot, that red line, which means that the targets are not actually adequate. In fact, they're woefully inadequate. Extinction Rebellion reckon that round about, this gives us a chance, a 50% chance, just a 50% chance of getting to 1.5 degrees and no more by 2050. So it's not a very good scenario and keep thinking of that word existential. So what are the targets locally? Well, from the uh, Climate Emergency Response Plan, um, you can see by 2025, CGWAT won a 17% reduction in total travel demand. They want a 25% reduction in car travel and they want to increase public transport from less than 10%, which is a dreadful thing, up to 18, which is, which is, which is not really that ambitious, and 50% low carbon buses by 2025. And you can see there that 74% um, of employed residents travel to work by car and 15% outside of the CWAC area. So a 25% reduction is taking us down to 55% just over. And that's still an awful lot of people using cars. 
and it might and on the reverse you might say yeah but that's that's still quite 25 percent still quite a good um reduction but it's not enough people because remember we're in that existential crisis so these targets although they they sound great they're just not enough we can't do our best we've got to go further over to you maria We've all seen pictures of the devastation worldwide caused by the climate emergency. And we are in a climate emergency, as Andy has said, so it's time to start acting like it and make radical changes to prevent an increase of more than 1.5 degrees. The way we live here in the Quack area has effect on global carbon emissions and those who contribute the least carbon emissions in the world are often the most affected. Next slide, please. We see the global devastation, but don't often register the impact of climate change locally. These are all photos from the Quack area earlier this year. Flooding like this will be more frequent, more devastating, and more costly if we don't reduce carbon emissions. Next slide. This chart, which shows CO2 emissions by sector in 2018, clearly illustrates that transport is the biggest carbon emitter in the UK. It accounts for a third of carbon emissions, and this sector is the only sector where emissions are increasing. Therefore, it makes perfect sense to tackle transport by offering a reliable alternative to the car. Next slide, please. A free bus service would help stimulate the local economy as residents who choose to use the bus would have a greater disposable income and hopefully would spend that locally. Next slide, please. It would aid a post, e a post economic recovery, a post COVID economic recovery by providing green jobs. Next slide. A free bus service is more likely to be used than a cheaper bus service. We need radical solutions in order to achieve net zero and levelling up. And we feel a free bus service provides such a solution. If more people use the bus, both traffic congestion and air pollution would also be reduced. And from a social viewpoint, a free bus service would, would enable friends and family to stay connected, reduce isolation and improve well-being. Next slide. Okay, so what are the barriers to a free bus service? We've kind of split them into three main areas. We think cost, profit, and political will. So let's first uh, have a look at um, the question of cost. It's estimated the cost of providing a free bus service in, the, in England outside of London is 1.8 billion a year. In Northwest terms, that's 0.3 billion. Sounds a lot of money, but when you kind of balance it to 37 billion for a track and trace that don't work, it's peanuts. If you have a look at the cost of the, the storms, and they've got a few we put there, it's 2.2 billion. So however way you want to look at it, a free bus service is cost effective and is necessary. And it's not just pounds, shillings and pence that we have to look at the cost of uh, not having a free bus service. Air pollution is, is costing the NHS 40 million and all the stress and strain that puts on social services and the people that work in the NHS. Air pollution is causing 28 to 36,000 deaths a year. So I think from a cost point of view, view and a health point of view, there's, we've got to really have a look at, uh, at buses and, and transport and do things that can, can reduce these CO2 emissions. The next item we looked at is profit. So why, why do we think profit is a barrier to having a, a, a free bus service? Well, it's because it takes money out of the service to the business owners, to the shareholders who may or may not use the bus service. That money goes to them, it doesn't go back into the service. And for bus companies, if there's no profit, there's no services. 
And Maria's told you the number that have been cut that aren't profitable in the CWAC area. Bus company's priority is profit and not service. So let's have a look at what some of these profits are. I've got two bar, bar charts I want you to have a look at here, the first and the second. You don't need to look at the third one. And what you'll see there is in the first bar chart, you've got stagecoach and go ahead in the kind of yellow and pink. That's their profit margin in a deregulated bus service. That's what we have. That's kind of like the Wild West. They, the bus companies do as they fancy and councils have very little control over what they do. Hence, they can make the profit that they're making there. If you have a look at the second buy chart, pie chart, uh, bar chart, you'll see that this is about London buses, which is regulated like a franchise system. And you can see there that both Stagecoach and Go Ahead have had their profit cut by 4.9 and 4.2% respectively. So that is under a franchise system, that's 4.2 to 5% nearly of money that can go back into the service if they were regulated. It's our money and it's our service and it needs to be used for us. And just a little bit more on profit. There's here some um, headlines. There's one in the evening standard there. Bus company shareholders rake in 184 million as routes are acts and fares rise by 55%. There's another one there about pocketing 18 million. And then in the mirror, they've got bus firms pay fat cats. This is a national um, media, but it's happening locally in CWAC. And the data's there. To, 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 to prove that. So finally, oh, and on profits, just finally, here we've got some figures for uh, the average annual shareholders' dividends over the past 10 years. And you see the Northwest, 18,460,700. And if you think about it, 40% of what the, uh, of revenue for the bus companies comes from the public purse. 60% comes out of your pocket. So you're paying for all of that, and that's going straight to bosses that isn't going into the service. That's a lot of, uh, uh, of money that could be used to make sure that we can have a free bus service. And finally, political will. Maybe for me, I think the biggest single issue that there is, because without political will, we won't be able to do it. I've got the bus, we've got the pictures of um, Stagecoach in uh, Manchester. And that's because, as you all most of you know, Manchester has now uh, decided to go down the franchising route. But it took seven years of, of campaigning by lots of activists to get this to happen. And it took somebody with political will, Andy Burnham, to go to put Manchester buses back into public control via the franchising route. What we need is our local politicians, MPs, councillors, to have the courage, the vision, and the tenacity to do what Andy Burnham's done. And that's to push for franchising and public control as the first step. We then want to completely own it uh, further down the line. And our campaign wants to work with the local politicians. We want to work with them so that we can do the things that we can do to help them give them that kind of courage and vision and tenacity. We want to make the case for public control. We want to build that campaign for public uh, control. And that should hopefully give the confidence to our councillors if we're working in partnership so that they can go forward and put to the government that they wish CWAC to um, go down the franchising route with all the benefits that that is bringing. Maria. So we welcome the government's national bus strategy which acknowledges the current bus system isn't working and systemic change is required. It's a great start, but we don't think it's anywhere near ambitious enough. It doesn't encourage residential behavior relevant to that required to stay below 1.5 degrees. We don't think it will achieve leveling up. Bus operators are currently hugely subsidized subsidized due to COVID. So bus op operators may initially support enhanced partnerships, but will that change once they're making a profit again? 
will they try to discontinue less profitable routes? For non-combined mayoral authorities like Quack, the route to franchising could take a number of years and there is no guarantee that the secondary legislation will be granted. Each local authority will be competing to gain a slice of the 3 billion transformational fund. There is a concern that this may not be fairly distributed. 3, million, 3 billion, sorry, over four years for the whole of England is not enough to transform the buses. Public ownership of the buses would mean complete control with all the profits being invested to improve the service and infra infrastructure. The Bus Act 2017 currently prohibits any further public ownership of buses and the National Bus Strategy currently does nothing to address this. We feel this should be changed and the bus should be for profit, for pe people not for profit. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we need? We need people and planet protected instead of profit. We need free public transport as part of that. And a package of measures, measures to decarbonize transport. That we believe should be central to the council's drive in, the, in terms of driving down CO2 levels and in their transport plan. This is gonna require proper regulation, improved service levels. And to do that really efficiently, it's gonna be publicly owned and run. So how do we plan to succeed in our campaign for better buses? And when I say succeed, I'm not being overly optimistic there. If we don't succeed, the fruits of an existential crisis come into play. So we have to succeed. So we're gonna do lots of lobbying of local and national politicians. We'll do a bit of agitating, educating. I'm sure we'll do some demonstrating. We'll be linking up with any nationwide campaigns. And of course, we'll be doing a lot of work and trying to get the support of you, the public. That kind of concludes our presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, we will take questions, but Dave, if I could ask you to kind of group them into threes or something like that, so it gives us a bit of thinking time, <laughs> not doing a, a straight Q&A. Of course, Andy. The thing is that uh, when you started, I, I got a request from Karen, um, who has listened very, very closely to what you and Maria have been saying. And, and, and I think, um, although I can't see her, um, because she hasn't got her, uh, her um, video on. I think that Karen would like to um, do a little bit of talking from the council side. Am I correct on that, Karen? Yeah, if you don't mind, um, I'll, I've just made a few notes and I'll just keep it very, very brief. Um, but just to respond to some of the things uh, that I've heard d discussed tonight. Um, uh, first of all, Maria, I completely agree with you that the national bus strategy, the government's national bus strategy isn't ambitious enough. Um, it, it, if we can just backtrack a couple of steps and I will canter through very, very quickly. Um, when I took the portfolio in 2019, one of the first things that we that we committed to do was um, a bus strategy review, which is now complete. And I, I know um, I know the comment that you made about having there being a lot of work that needed to be done. Um, we're actually in quite a strong position as a local authority because we actually did that bit of work before the national bus strategy came along. But my key my key problem with the national bus strategy is as you, as you set out, and that is that it it only offers advanced sorry enhanced partnerships to local authorities that are in areas that uh, are not 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 devolved powers in other words. So where you have a metro mayor like Andy Burnham or Steve Rotherham or in London, those franchising powers are, are, are part of the powers that they devolve, but we don't, Quack don't have that option. And the only way we can access that option is to actually approach the Secretary of State for that. Now, part of the problem with that, as, as you've already alluded to, is that ideologically the Tories don't like franchising because it put, because they prefer to put profit before people. And uh, that doesn't mean to say um, that we shouldn't work towards it and that we shouldn't set out a vision for achieving that. And that's something that I hope we can put in our next manifesto after consulting with wider uh, Labour Party local members. What we have done um, 
uh, since the national bus strategy uh, is use the work that we did on the bus strategy review to go for the enhanced partnership, which is it's a step in the right direction, um, but it, it, it's not a step far enough for the long term. Um, but it is a step in the right direction. Actually, what the government have done it, it, in the national bus strategy is set things up so that local authorities have to go for that. And if they don't go for that, the funding streams for the future are cut off to them. Mm. so so we've done that um and we we will we've got an initial i think it's something like one hundred and fifty thousand pounds to work on it and i think we're in a fair position in that as i say we've already done a lot of the work um that that's required um other authorities haven't um but it does mean uh, that we have that option in the future to go further um what we really need though is devolution um, my concern around devolution, and just as an aside, I don't know if you're aware of this yet, because it's not been publicly announced, but the, the government have replaced the devolution white paper with a levelling up white paper, and we're not quite sure yet what the implications of that are, but all indications seems to seem to be that it will be some more centralisation of power, not less. So that means we'll have less control um, over what we can do locally with transport. So campaign wise we need we need the powers to be able to go for a franchising option in the meantime we've worked with um steve rotherham's team um some of you might know liam robinson around um informal cross-border arrangements and we're doing this uh, we're looking to do this um with andy burnham as well with gm through transport for the north and started talking to cheshire east as well about that um and i think um, I would agree with all of the ambitions that you've set out, um, but also acknowledging the challenges that we have as a local authority in terms of uh, the powers that are available to us, but also the funding that's available to us. I, I'll, I don't mind telling you that before the last election, one of the one of the options that we uh, costed up was what it would cost the council if we offered free transport to under 25s, and it was absolutely cost prohibitive. Um, I'd be interested to know where those Northwest figures came from as well, because I, 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 I can't tell you whether they're accurate, but I know from what it would have cost in Quack just for under 25s, I would say that that 300 million estimate of free bus services in the Northwest is a conservative estimate. Actually, I think it would cost more. Ultimately, what we need is a Labour government that's going to deliver a national bus strategy um, that actually chimes with our values of putting people before profit um, and not the Tory values. So that that's my piece and if anybody wants any more information i'm happy to provide it um no problem at all thanks thank you very much indeed karen um one of the things which um, both andy and um, maria said on their talk is that they want to work closely with the council on this um what are the chances of that can i don't know if andy and maria have been in contact with you or anything like that but what are the chances of of um andy and maria doing um, demonstrations, um, talking to the public, goodness knows what else, with uh, your cooperation? Yeah, I, I have met Maria and I've met Anne as well. Um, I think Anne's on this call. Uh, yes, there you are. Um, so, yeah, absolutely happy to sit down and work with people, uh, particularly now as we move into the next phase of looking at what it means for the enhanced partnership. But any support that you can give us in terms of lobbying government very very welcomed um for me the frustration is not having the, the, the authority not having the powers it needs to go for franchising without asking the secretary of state and it's unlikely at this stage that they would grant them to us right well i'll leave that to andy and maria and, and Anne um to get in contact with you but what i want to do now is i want to open it up to everyone else here i've already got one person who've who has actually used the, the hand in the participants, and that is uh, Jackie. Jackie Davis, you have a question. Hi, yeah, well, um, thanks very much for the presentation, and um, thanks, Karen, for coming tonight as well. Yeah, just to repeat her, what Karen said, that like we're not a devolved power, we're not like Manchester, so that's, that's one of the, the main reasons we can't do anything. Um, also, like who wouldn't like a free bus service? Like if you ask people, in a survey, do they want a free bus service? Who's going to say no? But how are we going to pay for it? But we know already that we've lost 466 million pounds since 2010. 
And we know that 65 pence in every pound goes towards social care. So that leaves 35p to pay for everything else. Now, do we, do we want to take money away from social care? That, that, this is why councils can't do it. We need, to be, we need to be lobbying the government. We need to be lobbying the Tories, not the local council. They can't do anything. Their central funding has been cut. They, have, they can use their capital funding for infrastructure, so they can do things like improving the bus station, but they can't invest in services. So we really have to start realising that. We really have to start realising the, the cuts that they're under and how difficult it is for a Labour council to implement Tory cuts because that, this is what they do. They, they, um, the, the Tories are very clever. They make local Labour councils implement their cuts and so they turn the local electorate against the Labour council because people blame the council then. And so we don't need to be adding into that by looking for a free bus. We should be working, as David said, alongside the council into looking how can we make it more sustainable? How do we link up the buses with the electric scooters, with cycle paths to make it more sustainable and, make, and, and try and encourage people to use public transport? But people will use public transport if it's there. Do you know what I mean? They don't always need it to be absolutely free. Right, thanks, Jackie. Um... Andy asked if we can have a couple of questions. So the next person on the list is, is Ray McHale. Ray? Hi, Dave. Yeah, I was just going to make a, a couple of comments. And I, I, I don't doubt that, uh, you know, trying to get a regulated bus service is, is an important issue. Um, it, it worries me a little that we might distract from that sort of potential uh, by, uh, the, you know, a, press, a pressure for a free bus service. Uh, I know that's important to, to Andy and, and Maria, but uh, say it, it's something I, I find quite quite difficult. Um, I mean, it was interesting the figures that were given on emissions in terms of uh, you know the carbon emissions and from transport etc. But I, I, I suppose you know one of the big questions is if we had a free bus service, how much would carbon emissions from transport reduce? You know, so you know, that that's the key thing. We know there's a lot of emissions from transport, but if we're going to take a measure that's going to cost a lot of money what will be the impact on emissions uh, from spending that money? And is that necessarily uh, the, the, the best use of that money? Um, I, I say, I, I'm, I've never, uh, I, I think I accept the notion that you can't buck the market. Um, no, I don't necessarily believe in market mechanisms. You know, they, they reflect a reality uh, of you know what people are prepared to to pay for things, uh, and something like free free transport, you know, leaves you very much out in the wilderness. It, in that it doesn't give you any way to measure demand. Uh, you know, if if you put on a free a free ten a free bus service from Crewe to Chester every ten minutes, uh, you know that would be massively extravagant and completely underused. If you bought on a, a free bus service from Blaken to Chester City Centre uh, every 10 minutes, that might well be used. So you, you've got to have mechanisms for determining what the demand is, e even if there's no cost. Uh, and a cost is a way of, uh, of actually uh, doing that and trying to, to w work out what's good value. Again, you know, if, if you, the, the reason we operate park and ride is because uh, you know, the cost of parking in the city centre is expensive. So although it's a bit inconvenient for people, you know, people can be persuaded to do it because it, they can save money. And you know, from my viewpoint, if you operate a bus service, which is potentially cheaper than driving and driving and parking, then... Uh, you know that that's that's a viable way to operate a service and can still be attractive. 
uh, but you know, you've always got a measure of how much people are willing to pay uh, to switch between one, you know, that using their car or using the free bus service. Um, and, and clearly, with a need, you know, big issues could be around things like new technology. People need to be able to monitor, you know, is the bus coming on their on their phone. You know, so they're not standing at a bus stop hoping that a bus is going to turn up. It needs to be convenient and and easy easy to use. And I think the last thing I say is I, I, I've not looked into sort of local authority control of uh, buses. You know, I, I do know that Holton ran their bus service, or that you know they had the, a, a Holton bus company, which they allowed to close uh, when it was making. A, a pretty small deficit, frankly, you know, a, a, a figure which, you know, the cost of our losses on Barron's Key or something you know, overshadow massively. So, you know, if, if a council can run a bus company like in Holton, uh, you know, just with a bit of subsidy, then, you know, it seems to me that there, there should be a way for us to be able to be running those services. It shouldn't be hugely expensive, but, um, I don't think that could be based on a, on a free transport system. Thank you very much indeed, Ray. Um, I don't know who wants to go first, Andy or Maria, but I think both questions, both from Jackie and Ray, always bring up that horrible, horrible word, money. Mm -hmm. um, and I, 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 I'm sure that you'd like to say something about it. I will, up to yourself, Andy, up to yourself, Maria. And if Karen wants to come in, she's more than welcome. Maria, do you want me to answer that or do you want to answer it? Yes, you can start. Okay. Okay, on the um, data that Karen asked for, it's the Sustainable Transport System for the Northwest report, which was done by Gina Downing, a Green Party MEP. And that's where that 0.3 billion data comes from. I think it's great that Karen is saying that uh, CWAC want to go for a franchising because it's... It, it's got to it's got to have that vision and i think it's great that, that that they want us to do some campaigning because i think if we can use what we can do as campaigners that the council can't do and the council do what they can do that what we can't do that puts us together in the same direction because i truly do believe if you don't get transport rights and you don't have a really strong vision and go for it then i think that's going to bite you hard in, in the next council elections. And that would be a real shame because we need a Labour council and not get back to the, to the Tory council. O on Jackie's question, um, yeah, money's always a big deal, um, you know, and uh, can we afford it? Well, the question is, if it's an existential crisis, we can't afford not to do it. That's the bottom line. So we've got to find some way to do it. And I think what we can do with a campaign, if you do a campaign asking, the government to allow us to go to franchising if the government says no we do cut across all that kind of problems the council have of implementing tory cuts because they've got no option i don't think it's a question of whether it's free buses or care for for the for the um for the young and 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 what have you. you you don't put one against the other i think that that's that's a false way of looking at it we need to save the planet and if we don't do a really ambitious campaign and we don't get buses into public ownership that's going to have a major effect on not being able to save the planet but just on the question of, of economics free buses in france has resulted in low paid workers using the buses and not using any other form of transport and they've saved in something in the region of 400 euros a month that's 400 euros that's going into the local economy. That's 400 euros that's maybe stopping them having to go to a food bank. So the economics of it, their work. In some other areas, they've brought in an eco levy uh, where they, uh, like in London, they've done the, the congestion charge. That is unpopular at first, but if it's linked to a free bus campaign where people will go onto the, onto the free buses, it'll drivers will see that it's not an anti-car thing it just makes sense to travel for free which will then leave their cars at home which will then reduce carbon emissions from from, from cars um other ways of doing it wales have done it they've said all new road building is stopping let's stop the road building program in the uk 
and let's put all that money into public transport. So there's money there that can be redistributed and we need to make those claims and, make, and shout out for that's what needs to be done. So I think we, there's lots of ways of doing it. And of course, then there's, there's the, the final way. And that's because the government has the money. It's just a question that they don't want to give it. You know, so um, it, the money is there if we need it. Um, and if a Labour government gets in, they should do that. And I'm just on Ray's point, um, you know, on bus usage, it's been estimated that for every pound that's spent on uh, providing free buses, one pound seventy is generated, and that's quite a big thing. So if 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 you're saying to um, local businesses, look, there's a levy going on here, they're not going to be too happy about a levy, but they will be happy if every pound they're they're paying on that levy brings one pound seventy in. That's a good investment. So there's ways of doing it. I think we've got to be right outside the box thinking because we've only got eight years to twenty thirty. The chances of us getting below 1.5 is very, very slim at the present trajectory that we're, we're on. And so we've got to do it for me and maybe some others. I'll be dead and, dead and gone before the consequences. But for, for people's kids and their grandkids, there won't be a planet. And I think that's the main thing. So we just have to, to go for it. And I think if we do, um, you know... <laughs> You'll get you'll get the support of, of the of the public. And one final point, um, Nottingham Council uh, are a good example of how councils involved in controlling um, public transport pays dividends. They've put out nearly sixty million back into their bus service for having that kind of uh, control over it. So it's just about maybe a short term problem, but if you've got the vision and you and you and you're solid with it. You've got the public behind you. I don't think you can go wrong. You want anything to add, Maria? No, but I do need to tell Dave that there is questions in the um, chat as well. Uh, well, we don't bother with uh, questions in the <laughs> in the chat. What we do, we put their hand up because I want to see them ask the question. Is that all right, Maria? Okay. You you, you can answer the question if you want in the chat. Um, Karen, is there anything you'd like to say on that? Um, I mean, not not much to add, really. Um, I mean, I think Ray's point was really interesting about um, would giving a free service actually reduce carbon emissions as much. I understand why he posed the question um, about adult social care, but we I was just discussing this earlier today. I think for us in local government, that's the biggest problem at the moment. We've had a failure on fair funding review. It's not come forward. We've had a failure on local government funding review, which hasn't come forward. The white paper on adult social care hasn't come forward. If the government actually just prioritised social care and sorted that problem out, then I'm sure local authorities could deal with all the rest in terms of funding pressures. And, and I believe that we would be able to do better on transport for funding and do better on lots of other areas. But as has been rightly said by Jackie, um, you know, 65 pence in every pound is currently spent on adult and children's social care. So the system is broken and that's landing squarely with the Tory government. Um, on the issue of um, uh, the, the points raised around uh, what's happening in Wales with road building, um, I, I think that's an interesting point, stopping road building and investing in public transport. Um, again, um, something that we can only do with a Labour government, I, I, I feel. Um, we're in a situation at the moment where the government pitches local authorities against each other. They, they encourage a competitive environment. And if you don't bid for the money, you don't get anything. So, you know, and I'm sure our residents wouldn't thank us if we weren't ambitious enough to bid, bid for money. So I, I agree, it's a really interesting idea. And just one final point about, I think it relates generally to the point of... Um, incentivizing people to use buses we've we've obviously got some you know scooter trial going on um we've also got some quite interesting things happening around electric vehicles and with the best will in the world there are always going to be some people who won't make that modal shift to public transport buses and will want to stay in the cars 
but if we've got the capacity uh, and, and make it affordable for people to be able to buy electric vehicles, then I think that, I think the solution is somewhere between the two in terms of, of, of reducing our carbon emissions and saving the planet. I could, I could say more, but it's your meeting, so I'll, I'll shut up now and let others come in. Thank you. That's fine, Karen. Um, right, we've got a question here from uh, John, John Kresic. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dave. Yeah, um, well, yeah, I was just going to pick up on something that uh, Karen said that, um, you know, you basically got to beg the government for money for this, that and the other, you know, that that's the way that things are done, as I understand it, um, under the Tories, you know, um, I mean, Jackie Davis has talked about the, the loss of the blanket funding that local authorities get. Um, and that's, as I understand it, been sort of replaced with, you know, you, you have to beg for, the, for a bit of money for this and a bit of money for that. That's, that's, that's the way they do it. And, um, you know, that's going to continue. You know, I mean, we've got, a, we've got a Tory government with a majority of 80, you know, over the entire rest of them, you know. So, um, you know, until we get a Labour government, uh, the, the, the things are not going to change massively. So, um, you know, I just urge everybody to, to put the emphasis on working for a Labour government um, and, you know, getting out there. You know, I mean, I, I, a clutch of seats were lost in North Wales. You know, I mean, I, I'm actually talking to one or two people across in North Wales. And, um, you know, if people here want to have a, an away day to go and canvas in Wrexham, you know, uh, which was lost to the Tories last time, um, and get it back, then um, that would, would have a big impact on, on your aims as far as transport is concerned. So uh, that's where I'd like to see the, the emphasis is, is on um, working to, to win back Labour seats. Thank you, John. Um, Matthew Carter, um, hold on a second. Anne, what, what can, do you want? I can't put my yellow hands up, so I've got a white hands up. Can we come to you later? Yes, as long as you do that. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you. Matthew Carter. I um, want to start to say that I completely agree with the principles of the campaign. I think the idea of um, cheap or free sustainable transport is the future. It needs to happen and needs to happen as soon as possible. But as others have sort of raised, it will come with a installation of a replacement Labour government. Um, the, the, the sort of factual point I was going to make is I remember an interview Andy Burnham gave when he was selected as mayor or it might have been when he was being re-elected when he was announcing his um, um, reintroduction of nationalised bus service is he was told by no uncertain terms by the council, um, council leaders of Greater Manchester you're being, in, you're being installed onto us so we can have somebody who re, um, re-nationalises the bus service round here. Um, so he was, it was clear um, that that was the, the incentive for Greater Manchester to get a Metro Mayor. Um, I, I, I so quite agree with what Ray said on um, the principle of um, improving the sustainability of the transport network, because um, whilst a free service would be obviously a brilliant thing to be able to advertise it's um the funding of it for how frequent if you have a free bus every two every hour every two hours and it's very it's n not as sustainable as if you had a cheaper well-run world resource bus service um as best we can at the moment and um a, sort of a question direct to karen how much does it cost the council to do the free bus from the bus station to the Northgate Street, or the, where the old bus station is, if you know that at all. I'll let you off think the, about that, Karen. I, I can answer it off the top of my head. Um, it's about 60k per annum. It's only, um, well, that's a subsidised, obviously we subsidise that. But I don't know how that would compare. And we do subsidise lots of other services which the commercial operators wouldn't have wouldn't run otherwise because they're not profitable for them. But that, that's why it's broken, the current yeah. arrangement. Yeah. Right. Um, Andy and Maria, do you want to answer those? A uh, couple of points have been brought up by uh, both um, 
um, John and um, Matt. And I think I will let Maria, if she wants to say anything, Andy. Yeah, yeah. Um... Maria? While she's finding herself, or finding her, her, her own mute button, I could just quickly do the um, what John was saying about um, you now we we need a Labour government, and that currently Labour's policy on the buses is very good. You now they're going to extend the powers to re-regulate local bus services in all areas that want it means public control will be happening, and they'll support the creation of municipal bus companies that are publicly run for passengers, not profit. You know, and they've got and they also committed 1.3 billion in public funding for retrofitting thousands of diesel buses um, in the severe, in the most severe air quality problems. That's the current policy. That is the current policy. I believe it's all up in the air. So I think if that policy stays, that'll be great. If that policy doesn't stay and they change it, then that, that really does suggest that um, the commitment to that uh, climate emissions and um, public transport might not be as, as good as it sounds at the moment. But I hope when they do the review, they maintain the position that we've got in terms of policy on that. And just, and just to let people know that one of our, our people who joined our, our group uh, lives in Tarpley, and they did a, um, a real piece of work on how to connect up called Joining the Dots. Uh, I've got it if anyone wants it. Um, I've, of how you can connect up five uh, villages in the Tarpley area with Delamere and, and with um, train stations and shopping area. Uh, it was actually costed, but it was, it's been done two or three years ago. So the costings might not have to, have to look, be looked at, but the cost wasn't huge. It was an extra 30, 40,000 um, pounds to run that, uh, that little service with two buses running on about a one hour interval. Uh, local people wanted it. That's still sitting there, and I think that's something that maybe we'll have to flick across to Karen if she's not seen it, um, because that's the sort of innovative thinking we need. There are lots of barriers, people. There are lots of reasons not to, but the, none of them are good enough. None of them hold water because <laughs> we're heading towards the extinction of the species that's already started. It's continuing, it's continuing at a pace. It's no good looking at kind of short term fixes or just do this or we can't do that. We have to do it. It's not, a, it's not a, a, an option not to do it. You have to do it and therefore we have to be really bold. Um, and it doesn't really matter whether the government give it to us or not. If we go out and ask for it and get the campaign going with loads of people in CWAC area supporting Labour pushing to save the planet, reduce carbon emissions and get a free bus service, that has to be a vote winner from a cynical point of view. I'm not doing it for that, but I think, you know, that, that's, a, that's a factor you have to put in. So, you know, there's, there's no real um, issues with it from anybody. They just think, oh, well, can we? We have to, people. And you've got to, your best isn't good enough. We've got to do more than our best. And the council's doing a great job, but they've got to do more because of the crisis. I don't know whether- Maria. Mary is here. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Um, I can't remember all the exact questions, but I think from, from my point of view, linking up with other organisations like ourselves for national campaigns is going to be important because our councils can only do so much. Mm. And if lots of people from lots of um, organisations around England can get together to put pressure on central government. Um, I think that's one of the big things that we're actually going to need to have to do. Um, in terms of costing, I would say we're, there's, there's a lot of um, subsidies going into fossil fuels. Why can't some of those be flipped over? to um to a bus free bus campaigns um because that that would um 
that would help as well. Um, in terms of, we've, we've looked at um, one city that's done a free bus, Dunkirk in France, and it's been a huge success there. They introduced it in 2018. Um, a year after it was introduced, bus patronage increased 85% and half of the bus users used to drive. So that's half of the people giving their cars up. And one in 10 of the bus users sold their second car. It has massive impact on the behaviour change. So it was initially... Um, introduced for social reasons to enable low income workers to get to work but it's had many more positive side effects including lower air pollution and carbon emissions so these these projects are happening in different parts of the world and they're being successful and like andy said it may cost but because people have that extra money to spend locally, then that generates um, that generates enough money to be able to cover the cost long term, and that's that's what I feel about it. Thank you, Maria. Um, two questions left: uh, one from Clive, one from Anne, and we'll go with Clive first. Nigel. Yes, um, Nigel um, has not put, ah, he's put his hand up, yes, sorry. Clive, go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, firstly, just to back up that last point, um, I'm old enough and as much uh, enough of a southerner to remember the famous um, Ken Livingstone's mm -hmm. Fairs Fair campaign in London, uh, where following the um, one of the GLC elections, he attempted to reduce bus fares in London by a fairly substantial amount um, and uh, was taken to court by good old Tory Bromley Council, mm -hmm. who managed to persuade the government that it was an illegal act. Um, but during the short time that fares fare was running, the use of the bus services in London went up extremely quickly. Um, but that was just a, 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 an aside. But the, the comment I wanted to make was just to emphasise the importance of a much wider integrated transport policy. It's not just about buses. Um, it's got to be, I mean, if you bear in mind that the emissions from transport, presumably that huge uh, red um, uh, bar on the bar chart, uh, presumably included things like trucks uh, and um, diesel trains on the railway and all sorts of other things. And it's just, to me, important that we have a much more integrated approach to transport. And, I mean, just, uh, I mean, it's a fairly crude example. And it's not particularly well developed. But um, Ray mentioned, uh, you know, if you ran a bus from Crewe to, to Chester, well, there's a perfectly good railway line between Crew and Chester, which if it was electrified, and if a couple of stations were reinstated, including the one that's currently proposed for Tarpoli, um, you know, and if you electrified that line, uh, then you may get a benefit that's at least as good, as long as you can get the fares down as well, of course. I mean, I appreciate the fare side of it. But I just wanted to make the point that, that, that you know, important though the bus, bus issue is, particularly in rural areas, it's got to be part of an overall strategy, not just about buses, but about getting goods back onto the railways, uh, you know, making trucks um, more less, uh, less polluting and all of the other things that go along with it. Thank you very much indeed, Clive. Um, sorry, Nigel, your hand came up after I turned it off. <laughs> so I'll come to you after Anne. Hi, thank Anne. you. Um, a couple of points. First is, if you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. And, you know, we're in a crisis. And if there's one thing that COVID has taught us is that there are there are no governments that are creating, that are treating the um, climate crisis as a crisis. 
Look at the way we're, we're dealing with the pandemic and all the measures. Look at the way we're dealing with another um, a crisis. We aren't treating it as a crisis. We've got to think much bigger. So I quite agree with what, what um, Andy is saying. Um, I wonder, Maria, if, you know, we had the, the quick, um, the quick campaign um, and the and the work that was done for the bus lanes, and that, that's when Karen came to um, to my branch meeting. What what do you think about? Um, do you th how do you think people will see free buses? Um, do you think we might have the same issue there that there's that sort of hostility to more buses being on the road or or to that campaign? Um, and I think the final thing I'd like to say is I think it's 153 weeks ago, Greta Thunberg started having a school climate strike for the crisis and she was pretty ambitious and she ain't got there yet but neither has she stopped hmm. and maybe we can't do free buses in Chester at the moment and in, in, in CWAC at the moment but does that mean we should stop campaigning for them and I think Andy already made the point that you know you campaign for them you get the co you get the public on your side and then you look for um a national campaign at the next election that, that people can support. So I just think, you know, I do a lot of work now on the Green New Deal and green jobs. We've just got to think bigger. Thank you, Anne. Yeah, yeah. Um, Nigel, uh, and welcome. Thank you. Good to be back amongst you. <laughs> I'll, I'll lower the hand now. Uh, right. The my my. It's quite observation, quasi question. Uh, the observation is I've been working at St Nick's Catholic High in Northwich today. And if anybody else knows it, it's absolutely horrendous getting in and out because everybody is using their cars, parents are driving their cars. There's about three of at least three schools there, all in, in a very small area. It takes ages to get in. And I sat in the car about 20 minutes and there was still a before in the car park with the engine off before trying to leave. And still there was a big queue then at that point. And the, the emissions must be horrendous around about the school. Now, maybe, just maybe, and this is the question really, is could we not perhaps have targeted free transport um, make, maybe a trial so that we can get rid of congestions around not just those schools but other schools in in chester make them like a congestion free zone or something but we do need a plan to tackle horrendous things like that um it, it it's no good wringing our hands we've just got to we've got to get something done yeah thank you very much indeed nigel and it is good to have you back um I thought I was going to get away this week without uh, introducing Vicky with a question, but come on, Vicky, where are you? Hiya. No, you need to be unmuted, Vicky. I'm on, I think I'm unmuted now, aren't I? That's right, yeah. Cool. Right. Um... I just wanted to say that um, it's like a feeling like this, I'm getting this feeling, but um, it, it's too much to ask for free transport. In fact, it's a bit silly to ask for it because there's other priorities. And um, it's like something that can never be achieved. Um, and that first of all, you need to have Labour government before you could even think about it. So I wanted to sort of like address that. Um, well, we, we already know that lots of um, countries around the world and cities have um, free transport. Um, and Maria mentioned one, and I know one, another one, because I was actually there, it was Luxembourg. They have it. And they started off, maybe this is taking um, Nigel's point. They started off having the free transport on a Saturday. And um, with the increased patronage of the buses and um, the, uh, the, the businesses, 
um, and enjoying the, the benefits of having people come in shopping. Um, it's now free, as a, I think it's free every day now. And there's another country, Estonia. Um, they have free transport. And these are, uh, you know, Estonia is a very poor country. So it is definitely achievable, right? So we need to start off from that premise. We can achieve this. It's a question of whether, whether we want to. I don't really feel that we just have to wait for a Labour government. Yes, as I think we need to keep the, the profile high in terms of the policy, like Andrew said, it would be a shame if the policy was watered down, for example. So we, we need to keep that as um, a high priority. Um, but we need to be campaigning for it now because things don't happen just because politicians say yes. They happen because they respond to pressure. You've only got to look at the football turnaround, you, uh, you know, just recently for that. And um, the government's quite prone to... Um, to U turns, you know, because it's populist back government, I think, really. So, but I don't hear, I don't hear transfer. All, I, all I'm hearing from it, it is we can't afford it. Um, we've got to spend money on social care. So there isn't money for anything. So that's it. And then people just become disillusioned with politicians if that's all they say. See, although that's the reality. We have to say, yeah, but we can change things. We need to, everyone to be involved. We're, we're in for creating a better world. You know, well, one, a world that will exist in first, but a better world for everyone. So I think we need to be a bit more vocal and a bit more confident. That's what I would say. Thank you very much indeed for that, Vicky. Um, those are our questions. Would um, Andy, Maria, like to come back on any of those last three or four questions? I think Maria. I can answer Anne's question. She was asking is, um, is our campaign basically anti-car? And I don't think it is. It's an alternative to the car because, it, and it's an alternative that's convenient and hopefully free. Um, we see that it will encourage travel behaviour change um, because if you're going into town and you have to pay for parking, you've got the hassle of finding a parking space and the cost of it. If you can nip into town on a free bus, then it makes far more sense to jump on a bus. Um, it's not anti-car. Karen said herself, we're not going to get some get some people out of the cars, no matter what we do or what we offer, we're not going to get them out of the cars. But there'll be a lot of people who will be encouraged. And I was speaking to someone recently and she said if she wants to go into the town for what she pays for the bus there, if the two of them go, it's actually cheaper to go by car. So there's a couple that I know who, if we had a free bus, would definitely use it. And there's going to be a lot of people like that. So I don't think it's anti-car, but it, it's just an alternative. Drivers will benefit also because if there's less, pe less cars on the road, there's less congestion. So their journey times are going to take less as well. So it's a win-win. Win-win. Yeah. Okay. Andy? Yeah, I'm glad Clive uh, raised London because I was in London at the time, Clive, when Ken Livingstone was in his um, element and love him or hate him, what Ken Livingstone is, is a visionary and a hugely determined man to make sure that what he de decides is right happens. He did that with the fairs fair and I remember the Bromley Tories scuppering that, but a lot of that policy of Ken Livingstone is still sitting in... Um, in the fair policies in, in London and, and bus usage did go up hugely. It was a hugely popular thing what he did, you know, but he got a lot of flack for it, you know, and Ken Livings has done, done other visionary things like the Thames barrier he brought in and everyone said, well, what are you doing that for? What are you spending, wasting money on the barrier? It's ridiculous. Well, it's not ridiculous, is it? Because it saved London from being flooded on numerous occasions, you know? So I think 
whether you love him or hate him, the vision Ken Livingston has and the and the and the effort he'll put in and stand up for his arguments and make sure that he what he, he's decided to do is right. He gets people behind him, and he was hugely popular in London, uh, and he's shown that by getting re-elected as, as, as mayor on, on, on several occasions. I think Nigel's point about targeting free transport, why not? We have to start somewhere, you know. Um, let, let's let's start somewhere and make it popular, um, you know. And I think just on Vicky's, just very quickly, there are there are over 100 towns and cities worldwide that now offer local free buses, and, and Vicky mentioned a couple. In the hugely uh, revolutionary country of the USA, there's 30. So America, with all its kind of huge super pro capitalist position, it's got towns offering free bus services. You know, uh, this is not revolutionary stuff. This is not kind of um, out there mad mad stuff. This is sensible absolutely sensible policies that are absolutely necessary we've just got to articulate them properly we've got to stand by what we're going to we're going to do and then we've got to fight to get them to come along because we won't get anything unless we put our shoulder to the wheel and you know i think you know the days have gone for us just to vote people in we've got to get out and do it ourselves because if we don't no one else will uh, and so you know um I think, I, I think I'll, I'll end on. I think, I think we've covered them all. I hope we have, um, you know, but, uh, and if anyone wants to join our campaign, sorry, Anne, if anyone wants to join our campaign, then please get in touch. That is cool. Um, it's been a pleasure to uh, hear yourself, Andy, and also Maria. And, it, and it's been um, absolutely marvellous that um, Karen's been able to join us as well, because the one thing which, which I think that we've actually shown is that um, us ordinary people want to talk to the council and I think that the council um, want to talk to us and if we can work together we can do a lot of things a lot of good things um, not only in this city but also in CWAC so Karen thank you very much for for attending it's been absolutely great we did